Hello, my name's Guy Montrose. I'm here with Aubrey de Grey. I do actually know Aubrey. We've uh, met before, haven't we? Once or twice. Once or twice. Uh, Aubrey, thanks for being with us. Um, Aubrey, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and, and what you do? Sure. So I'm what I call a biomedical gerontologist, which means that I'm interested in ageing as a biological phenomenon, but I'm not only interested in understanding the molecular and cellular details of how we age, I'm interested in doing something about it. And when I say doing something about it, I mean really bringing ageing under proper, complete medical control, the sort that we're familiar with with most infectious diseases. So I'm the Chief Science Officer of a foundation that's been created around the work that I've been doing over the past 15 years or so. That foundation is called Sense Foundation. It's headquartered in California, though we have activities internationally. We have a subsidiary in the UK. And so I divide my time between these places and we're focusing on developing regenerative medicine against aging. We think that within the next few decades, it's quite likely that we'll be able to develop technologies that can really truly postpone the ill health of old age for as long as we like. Okay, uh, well, are there any very specific principles of, of the aging process that, that you're looking at? The aging process is actually much better understood by scientists than most of the general public have tended to believe. We have a lot of information now over the history of gerontology of what goes on, what molecular and cellular changes happen throughout life in the body as side effects of the body's normal operation that eventually accumulate to a level that the body is not set up to tolerate and therefore cause the emergence and progression of the diseases and disabilities of old age. So um, exactly how we would describe those changes now, you get different descriptions from different gerontologists, but there's not really much substantive difference in what people think about what's important in ageing and what isn't. So then the question is, can we actually develop ways to do something about that? And the big, if you like, the big eureka moment that led to the work that I've done over the past 10 or 12 years, and that the foundation I have um, talked about does, is that we, I realised that we might be more able to create therapies that actually repair the damage of aging, so effectively turning back the biological clock, than the approach that people had historically been looking at, which is essentially just to slow down the biological clock and um, retard the rate at which these various types of damage come into existence. That's something of a counterintuitive um, proposal, but it becomes a lot less counterintuitive when you think about the ways in which we successfully extend the lifespan of simple man-made machines like cars or aeroplanes or whatever beyond how long they were designed to last. What we do is essentially preventative maintenance periodically, and that is the repair of pre-pathogenic damage, damage that has accumulated as a side effect of normal operation of the machine, but that has not reached a level of abundance that makes the doors fall off or whatever. It's exactly the same for, uh, for the human body, because the human body is a machine, albeit obviously a very, very complicated one, one that we don't have the plans for. Okay. Um, some, some people um, have been rather sceptical about some of, some of your claims, um, particularly in terms of um, you know, claims that the process of ageing could be cured. In the future, I mean, how, how do you respond to those those people? There are a number of different sources for the scepticism and opposition that have been um, that has been um, raised against the ideas I've been putting forward, and it turns out that it's not too hard to rebut those criticisms. Which is, of course, why those criticisms have become progressively more muted and why I've more or less won the argument in these cases. Um, the first thing is really just terminological. You use the word cure in your question, and when people talk about curing ageing, that gives the impression that what we're talking about here is some one-off treatment that will eliminate ageing from the body so that the body is then non-ageing until such time as it might become in some way reinfected. And that is certainly not what I'm saying we have any chance of doing, or indeed what anyone is saying we could have any chance of doing. Aging is something that happens as a result of the intrinsic normal operation of the human body. It's not like an infectious disease at all. So any treatments that we might develop that would indefinitely postpone aging would do so by being periodically applied, not by just being applied once. 
The second reason why there's been a bunch of criticism of what I've been saying is because I've been talking about the prediction that we, we could indefinitely postpone ageing and people have interpreted that to mean that I think that in the foreseeable future we will develop, develop therapies that perfectly repair all of the various types of damage of ageing. But in fact, what I've been saying since the beginning, which I was obviously, you know, people could have actually known if they'd bothered to read what I wrote, um, is that within the next few decades we have a very good chance of developing medicines that are fairly comprehensive against ageing, sufficiently comprehensive to buy us time to spend the next few decades developing further improvements so that they're more comprehensive and they're more comprehensive still. And in this way, we should be able to stay one step ahead of the problem indefinitely, even though we never solve the problem 100% completely. The third, and perhaps the most important, because it's the most substantive reason why there's been scepticism about this work, is with regard to the technical details of the first step, the step that gets us maybe a few decades of extra life. And here the problem is a rather different one. Here the problem is because the approach that I've been proposing to, um, to apply regenerative medicine to ageing, to repair the damage of old age, has entailed bringing together expertise from two very different fields that had not previously been brought together. The first one being regenerative medicine, of course, and the second one being gerontology, the study of ageing. Regenerative medicine is a very respectable and burgeoning discipline right now, and indeed it was pretty burgeoning when I came along a decade or more ago. But regenerative medicine has grown up as a concept for application to acute injury, things like spinal cord trauma, stuff like that. And there has not been a much recognition of the idea that it could be used against ageing. Um, conversely, gerontologists, people who study ageing, have not really had any reason to know very much about regenerative medicine because they haven't regarded it as relevant to their work. So when I came along, I had to change all that. I had to, some, in some way, um, first of all, talk to the regenerative medicine people and get them to realise that there was a new application, a very important new application to their expertise. And that went very well very quickly. I, I encountered pretty much zero resistance to that. Everyone was very enthusiastic and so on and supportive. However, on the other side of the equation, when talking to the gerontologist, it was a different matter entirely. These people came along with, as I say, not very much knowledge of really what had already been done in regenerative medicine and therefore with an exaggerated idea of what remained to be done. And that meant, of course, that they thought that I was being extremely unrealistic in my claims that the, uh, the, the things we did need to do to get from where we are today to where we need to be um, were actually plausible. That took some time to break down. But over the years, of course, I've been running conferences. I've added, I edit uh, a very successful academic journal. In many, many ways, I've been able to get these communities together and um, engage in a degree of mutual education, so to speak, that has allowed gerontologists to get a much more detailed and sophisticated idea of what I'm actually saying. And the result now is that the approach that I've been proposing all of these years is taken extremely seriously. It's certainly not the case that everyone says it's the best way to go, but certainly there's general acceptance that it's one worthwhile alternative. So you know, five years ago, I would never ever be invited to speak at a mainstream gerontology conference. These days I'm invited to organise whole sessions, you know, that's the sort of dis distance that we've been able to come. Well, that, that must be very gratifying, that must be very fantastic for you and your work. From a personal perspective, um, I guess first of all I'm, I, I'm pretty thick skinned in the first place. Secondly, the opposition and scepticism that I faced early on was very predictable. I was it was very obvious from the beginning that this was going to be the sort of reaction I would receive from a large section of the gerontology community. So, on the one hand, I was never really particularly discouraged by it. Conversely, today, um, yes, obviously, it's very nice to have made this progress, but I'm also always acutely aware of how much further progress there is to be made, how much work there is to be done in the, at, at the lab um, and around the world and how much more work there is, of course, more broadly within the general public to persuade people that this is a good idea and therefore to get governments and other major sources of funding to actually regard it with the importance that it deserves to be regarded. So, yes, I'm happy with how things have gone, but I'm definitely not, not um, you know, um, resting on my laurels.